My name is Major David McBride. I used to be uh, an army officer who was specialised in the law, a legal officer, uh, the Australian Army. Before that, I was a barrister in the Supreme Court of New South Wales. And in another life, I was an officer in the British Army. Uh, they're my basic uh, sort of career milestones. Uh, now I'm a whistleblower, fighting uh, for my life in the Australian courts uh, in about five weeks' time. And when I was young, I wanted to be a soldier. I was at boarding school and I was thrilled by uh, the stories of the Second World War, uh, people escaping from prison and war camps, the wooden horse. They used to read us stories when we were too young to read them for ourselves. Uh, and I loved that. I also loved the sort of Greek myths. I loved uh, the sort of heroic tradition, I guess. I got into law school. I completed law school uh, uh, just. Again, I can only say I was lucky because I didn't really want to be there. And I uh, did a bit of horse trading with Oxford University and I was very lucky to be able to get a place at Oxford University. Where again, I didn't particularly want to go. And it was snowing, it was cold, and uh, everyone seemed to have thick glasses and lab coats. And I thought, you know, this did not look like the sort of place I wanted to be. Anyway, I got there uh, for myself and I loved it. It was actually, it was fantastic. You know, really good people. I think one of the secrets of life is to uh, surround yourself with people better than yourself. And, and I really met at, at Oxford University at Oriel College. I met a lot of people who were better than myself. Uh, that was when uh, my life really started to sort of, I started to become the person I wanted to be, I guess. I won like a lot of these twists of fate, sliding doors moments. I met some people from the British Army. Uh, and I instantly knew that's what I wanted to be. There was something about them, they, the way they carried themselves. And I thought that's what I wanted to be. So I went and saw the recruiting office in Oxford. They were slightly bemused that an Australian wanted to uh, join the British Army, but they said there's nothing against, you can do it. My father came to visit me unexpectedly at Oxford and he saw the recruiting papers, which I'd half completed. And he was like, what's this? Robert? He was very Australian. He was very like, oh, you know, the British Army sipped tea while, uh, while Australians died on the beach at Gallipoli and you're, you're not going to join that rebel. And I joined before he even knew. He was hoping I was going to be a barrister in London in one of the great inns of court. Uh, and uh, before he knew it, I was in basic training in, um, on the outskirts of London, getting shouted at by uh, people who'd just come back from the Falklands War. Uh, no, I loved it. I never looked back. I thought it was the greatest thing. And I looked back at photos at the time and uh, I could see I was still a boy. As soon as I did basic training, I became a man. And I, uh, I went to Sandhurst eventually. I was a, I was a soldier. I spent um, six years in the British Army. You know, it was a great experience for me. I, again, it, it made me a, a better person. And uh, the motto of Sandhurst was serve to lead. Anyway, I left the British Army. I went in Afghanistan as a sort of security guy, fixer. And uh, that was my job, going around uh, taking camera crews into unusual places. I met the Taliban when they'd pretty much just taken over the country. I left that job. I just got a job as a lawyer for the first time in my life. And um, even though I had two law degrees, I could see that I missed the army. I missed the service. I missed, uh, it, yeah, the law didn't have enough for me. Uh, and I started doing uh, part-time reserve work for the Australian uh, military, and I really enjoyed it. And my wife uh, said, look, you, you look really happy every time you come home from, from doing your army work. Do you want to join full-time? Uh, which was bigger for her, because you know, being an army wife is not necessarily uh, that much fun. Uh, and I joined um, on my birthday because it was important. I chose my birthday and I went and swore on a Bible uh, to uh, basically dedicate my life to doing the right thing uh, for Australia. And it was an oath that I, uh, I, I took seriously. Uh, from Townsville, I got my first trip to Afghanistan in 2011. Again, a good job advising an American commander uh, who was in, 
charge of the whole province. And then I was promoted from that to the Special Forces, which is, which is the sort of ultimate job as far as I was concerned. In 2013, when I got there, I really felt like I was achieving uh, everything I wanted to be. To a certain extent, being a, a legal officer was was the best job for me because it was uh, a combination of being a lawyer and uh, a soldier. And then when I was there in 2013, I'd already had some doubts from my first uh, tour in 2011. In fact, I'd had it um, not just from the tour in Afghanistan, but I began to wonder whether the Australian military hadn't become what I call politicised in that uh, rather than fight the enemy or uh, defend Australia to the best of our ability, etc. We were guided by doing whatever would make us look good in the eyes of the population um, with, uh, with PR. And that meant in the in the first in my 2011 camp, that meant saying everything was going well, even when it wasn't. Uh, putting up PowerPoint slides that said, "Look, we're going to win next year," without anybody saying, "Well, we said that last year. We said that the year before." Uh, and that bothered me. I thought we are just window dressing. Uh, we know it's wrong. We're doing it uh, for self-serving purposes because we get promoted. We weren't winning. We knew we weren't winning. Uh, our allies were a shambles and a bunch of, you know, drug dealers, pedophiles, liars. Uh, we weren't saying that. We kept demonising uh, the enemy, like they were the bad guys, uh, and we were the, you know, the saviours. And uh, we knew a lot of that wasn't true. And it came no surprise to me that in 2000 and, uh, 2020 was it 2021. Uh, the whole regime that we'd installed collapsed in a day. Now, most insiders could see that was going to happen. Uh, and what it, it enraged me was that no one's, you know, it was the, it was the best kept secret. Um, that bothered me and I saw that early on, but I saw things that, uh, that really made me become a whistleblower in, in 2013 on my special forces tour. Uh, and it started small, but when you work in the industry, uh, you can sometimes see that small things lead to very big things. And I could see we were suddenly investigating people who are just defending themselves. Uh, and it was clear and it wasn't, you know, there were no questions. And we were trying to put them in jail. And I thought about it, I thought, why are we doing this? It was suddenly changed in 2012 to 2013. We are suddenly uh, running around trying to find scapegoats. And there'd been a lot of rumours about murders in 2012. Particular people, it was well known. Uh, kill counts had become a big thing. Uh, and it seemed very strange to me that after a year of very questionable operations, kill counts and uh, complaints being made, uh, complaints that were um, rejected, because there were complaints against famous soldiers which were rejected. And now in 2013, we're suddenly trying to throw people in jail who haven't done anything. So I started looking into, I actually knew in September 2013, when I was in Afghanistan, I didn't know I was going to be a whistleblower, but I knew I was going to end up fighting my own organisation. I didn't make it obvious at the beginning, but I knew that uh, somehow, you know, it was going to be a contest between me and the leadership, uh, and I was going to try to bring them down, and, you know, unless I died first. Because I could see we, we had become incredibly cynical where we would make heroes when they weren't heroes. We would make villains when they weren't villains. Uh, we didn't care about whether we were actually winning the war. We put out false messages. The Afghan people meant nothing to us. Uh, it was all uh, a political pantomime, an ad. And I, uh, I thought maybe grandiosely, <laughs> uh, I thought um, hey, I'm gonna take this on, it's wrong. Um, and uh, 
uh, it was went against everything that I'd been brought up to do. And, and even though from, uh, it became clear that once I started to ask questions and once I started to cause a fuss that I became the enemy, uh, that didn't put me off. I really thought it was going to be such a bitter fight, I thought I would probably get a pat on the back uh, relatively soon. Um, however, it is the problem is bigger than I first thought in that there was no... Uh, if you are complaining about uh, major wrongdoing in an Australian government department, they don't roll over. Um, they, uh, you become the enemy. They will uh, go for you. And there's a no, there's very little you can do. There's no independent whistleblower authority. Well, hopefully we're gonna get one. There's no ICAC. Uh, so if you take on the at federal level, if you take on the federal government, uh, you've got one hope and that's the media uh, will help you, but that's, that's not guaranteed. You think, and I was the same, you'd think if you had a really good story, you would definitely get the media on side. And this is one of the frustrations that I've got. You will easily get a story up about bad soldiers, um, people at the bottom, uh, but kind of get a story up about a bad government, uh, people at the top, much harder. Uh, and trying to get any media organisation to take that on has been hard. Possibly the only way I was going to be able to win this battle was to have a trial, because it was the only time uh, that the government can't use uh, their incredible um, overreach with media against you. When they've got people in the witness box and you can ask them direct questions. Did you know? Did you try and go it up? Why did you do this? Why did you do that? The fact that I'm the defendant doesn't stop me asking questions of the government. I'm trying to put the government on trial. I have to, I have to be the defendant to do that. I always knew that was what's going to happen. Uh, and that's one of the ironies of my case. I did, when, after I went and saw the ABC, uh, when I couldn't get uh, I tried all the internal avenues. I knew that wasn't going to work because I was effectively complaining about the Chief of the Defence Force to the Chief of the Defence Force because he runs the complaint department. And also, being a military lawyer, you know how the complaint system works. And you know that what in anything big, which is actually towards the organisation, what they will do is draw it out, starve it of oxygen. I also knew that I had to go through that complaints process. Uh, before I went to the media. Uh, there was an act passed in 2013, funnily enough, to enable people like myself to go to the media. That's going to be the big question uh, in my trial, the first question, did I come within that act? It's quite a flawed act. I don't think anyone has actually uh, successfully come within this act yet. Doesn't mean I won't, but uh, it's kind of quite funny. I think they're going to change the act, but I'm going to be tried under the old. Did I come within the, the terms of the Act? Uh, and one of the uh, interesting points about it is uh, I didn't particularly try in the sense it was never my intention not to go to jail. My intention was to improve Australia. My intention was to shake up our system of government where all government departments increasingly, uh, rather than work for the good of Australia, they work for the popularity of the minister. Uh, and that is wrong, I believe. I wouldn't complain if my charges were dropped, but in some ways it'd be disappointing because it would stop us uh, as a nation being able to look at that central question and say, who do the, the government departments, defence, who do they work for? Is the truth important? Can they just make shit up in order to win an election, in order to uh, make a minister look popular? Can they give people medals who don't deserve them because they speak well and they're handsome? Uh, and the minute that will make the minister look good. Uh, at what point, uh, what value of truth? Uh, we need to look at these questions and uh, for me to get the real satisfaction that I want, I'm gonna have to have a trial. It's quite a high risk. Uh, my case, and uh, but it's the only way I can see um, uh, uh, getting out of it is having that trial. I do have a defence, and that I can say the reason I became a whistleblower was what I saw 
in the Australian military was so bad um, and they weren't going to fix themselves and something had to be done about it. And so then the judge is obliged to look at what I saw uh, and decide whether it really was so bad. And if I'm acquitted, it will only be because the judge has said, yeah, it was pretty bad and they weren't going to fix themselves. Uh, and he did the right thing. And that will, uh, it won't just mean I get acquitted, but it will mean uh, it will be something written down uh, in public to say the defence force is broken. Uh, it needs to be fixed. It's been bent out of shape by politics, uh, by people who are just saying, and there's a real reason for it, because unfortunately the politicians get to promote the generals. So what's the general going to do? Is he going to disappoint the politician or is he going to is he going to um, do what the politician wants? Because they've got, you know, obviously, in, in an ideal world, in the world I grew up in, you didn't just uh, say yes, Minister. You know? Sometimes you said no, Minister. And if you got sacked, you got sacked. Because your honour uh, and your duty to the nation was more important than your job. After my trial, if I win, I want to go back to the, the defence force in some sort of consultancy role and, and, and help them fix it, you know. There's no, it's easy to criticise without a solution, but there are solutions and to get some sort of way where they are a little bit more insulated from political interference. Now, a lot of the things that the politicians say are regurgitations of the results of polling of marginal seats. The politicians will do polling and they will say things or hear things and they will, uh, and the military will follow that. But it's a, we can't run a war like that. And you can't run a country like that. Uh, you need uh, people who make decisions for the benefit of actually getting things done. Uh, you know, I'm facing what they call an unlimited sentence. And I don't, as far as I know, I'm the only one that's ever faced unlimited prison. I think it means that if uh, execution was uh, illegal in Australia, that would be a possibility. Uh, but it wouldn't change my view. I wouldn't, uh, you know, being a soldier, you're prepared to die for your country, and uh, I, uh, I signed up for that. So it's not bullshit for me to say I'm prepared to die for this, and I, if necessary, um, I would be prepared to die on that principle to say that the government is meant to work for the good of the country and not for the popularity of the government and uh, that is really what it comes down to. Uh, we can't just make stuff up, we can't just lie to the public, there's no excuse for it, it's not justified, it's not national security. National security is something which is thrown about in my case, <laughs> I've damaged national security, that doesn't stand up. Talking about what went on in Afghanistan, talking about murders, talking about cover-ups, uh, is not a breach of national security. It may be nationally embarrassing. I like a lot of these uh, national security laws, they are abused. They are abused uh, to be, instead of fighting terrorists, which is what they were uh, passed for, they are used against dissenters of the government like myself, like Bernard Caleri, uh, like Witness K. They're chasing me uh, to make an example of me, I think, more than the irony is one of the principles of being a Defence Force officer is, uh, along with honour and duty, is a th concept called moral courage. And they still teach that to, uh, you know, Duntroon graduates. And uh, without any kind of irony to say that that's actually not uh, what they want. <laughs> they want obedience, uh, blind obedience, and they don't want people to stand up if they did. Why would they try to put me in jail? Uh, I'm very proud of what I've done. I've got two teenage children. Uh, they have lived through this. Pretty much all they can remember um, is me uh, in my fight for the government. Ten years, it started ten years ago. If I have to go to jail for what, to try to make the country a better place, to try to stand, to try to do everything I've been trained to do as a lawyer, as a soldier, as a person. You know, I will do that. And again, it's the best thing I've ever done. In many ways, it's the culmination of my life. It's hard not to see that this is my life's purpose. Uh, too many coincidences. But even I, just 
reached a point where I could not go past. The standard you walk past is the standard you accept, they say. I had to stand up. It's not, as most whistleblowers say, it's not a choice. It's not something, you know, oh, maybe I will, maybe I won't. If you start thinking like that, you're not going to do it. A lot of people used to say to me, oh, uh, don't start a fight, you can't win. Uh, but that, for me, that's, that's kind of, a, that's cowardice. Uh, that's an excuse to say, well, I can't win this, so I'm not going to do the right thing. It's not about whether you can win it or not. You have to fight the fights that have to be fought. Uh, whether you're going to win, uh, that's not, that doesn't affect whether something is right. Uh, one of the things I always say, uh, I'm so grateful for the support I've received. I've received a lot of support. I do really, I've come to really love Australia at a deeper level now because of the, the, the amount of people who support me. Really good uh, people. Um, anything final that you want to... No, I don't think so. I think we've, uh, I think we've covered it. Just you know, and again, I, I, I can't thank uh, you, my team, and everybody out there um, uh, enough for for supporting me. And I think we can win this.